Hey listeners, we're nearing the end of our 15th anniversary fundraising campaign and we need your help to meet our goal. This campaign offers you a chance to win a unique food and music experience in one of the most exciting cities in America. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and you'll be entered to win dinner for two and two tickets to a concert in one of eight amazing cities. New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Ardmore, Pennsylvania, and Asheville. All donations support our work educating food system storytellers. And when you donate, you can choose one of those cities and you'll be entered to win dinner and two tickets to a show. So help us reach our goal and enter to win dinner and a show in the city of your choice. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. Heritage Radio Network is food radio supported by you. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by Roberta's, home of Heritage Radio Network for 10 years. Learn more about Roberta's at robertaspizza.com. Welcome to The Grape Nation, your weekly wine journey. Our guest is Isabella Geron. We'll talk to Isabel about raw wine and a lot more. Uh, as always, Isabel brought uh, an interesting wine for us to taste for our weekly wine sip, a skin contact blend from Malle in the south of Chile. So that should be interesting. I'm your host, Sam Ben Ruby. Stay with us for The Grape Nation on the Heritage Radio Network. We bring wine to the people. Isabel Legeron is the author of Natural Wine, an introduction to organic and biodynamic wines made naturally. She is France's first female master of wine. Isabel created Raw Wine, the world's largest community of low-intervention, organic, biodynamic, and natural wine producers, supported by fairs, a wine club, and an online shop. She has long advocated organic farming practices and proper living wines. Isabel Legeron is a true maverick and a crusader for natural wine, and her influence has touched every part of the world. Thank you so much for having me back on the show. I'm very well, excited. those were my lines, Isabel. Welcome back to the Great <laughs> Nation. So it's great to have you. Um, I just want to say it's a pleasure to have you back on the show. And the reason that you're back on the show is you'd be back anyway, but every time the raw wine fair rolls into New York, um, it's an opportunity for me to see you and, you know, even get involved with you, which we'll talk about. So we're talking to Isabel today in New York City, specifically Brooklyn, specifically South Brooklyn, close to East New York and near JFK Airport, um, in advance of the raw wine fair this weekend. All right. So I mentioned this to you off air. We've gotten into a lot of your background and past podcasts. Um, but there were two things, you know, when I reprepped for the show that I got curious about that I didn't remember. And you had a successful different career than what you're doing now. And you made this change from that career to pursue the master of wine certificate, which anybody who knows, you know, knows how difficult it is. Um, so I just want to get into your head a little, you know, what compels somebody to really make that turn? And then afterwards, as that was happening, tell me where that moment or that exposure or that influence to put you in that nat natural wine direction came. So maybe I'll, I'll answer the first question first, yeah. uh, because that, in a way that makes more sense. So, and thank you, yes, for traveling all the way to <laughs> to this very remote corner. Um, it's actually you know, pretty nice. <laughs> my, my team and I landed yesterday. We literally, you know, came back from, from Los Angeles where we had, you know, our first sort of fair of, of, of the tour. Um, and, and yeah, we're on the road for a month. So it's, uh, you know, it's nice that you're coming to us. Thank you. So, you know, 
for me, natural wine is, is um, and the more, actually, the more I, I, I think about what natural wine is, the more I realize it's, it's, it's like where your head and where your heart is. Uh, it's not so much ticking boxes, but it's about a way of being. And the more I talk to the growers, the more I realize, you know, it really is about who they are that drives them to to be natural. And it's, I, I would say it's the same with me. So I was brought up in a very, you know, very small, small holding far, farm. My family grew everything. We ate everything we produced. We were big into foraging and I'm still, I now have a two and a half year old daughter and, and we go mushrooming together. <laughs> um, so I passed that down, you know, the next generation. So <clears throat> for me, nature and being in touch with seasonality has been at the core of my upbringing. And at the time, when you're growing up, you you know, you're kind of, you don't really get how important or how special that is. And and now I realize I was very privileged to have had a very, very low key, in a way, you know, sort of um, upbringing and, and very driven by nature. And then I was growing up, obviously, this, you know, this was not very important to me. And I went to university and I ended up in London working um, for, you know, in, in the publishing world, I actually ended up running a uh, a company that was publishing diversity titles because at the time you know like 30 years ago that was <clears throat> that was still something you know like um anyway but you know and um, but when i when i was uh, 28 uh, my my dad died of lung cancer mm. uh, from overspraying the vineyard so you know he never smelled so he never he never smoked in his life before um and it was very sudden he, he died uh, you know within 3 months of being di- diagnosed um, and for me, that was like a, a very big wake up call when I realized that, you know, I hadn't really been focusing too much on, on my family. I was, I was, I was living in London, my family, all my family lives in, in Cognac in France. And at that moment, I just, I just really realized that actually wine was really important. We, we, my family farms grapes and makes, uh, eau de vie for the Cognac industry. And at that moment, I realized actually, you know, <laughs> grapes and, and farming was really important. I was, um, I had kind of neglected it and, and, and I, thought, uh, let me get an education in wine, even though I'd already done like, you know, five years uh, studying business at university. So I went back to studying. So I did the diploma. And at that time, you know, I knew nothing about wine. And when I say nothing, I didn't know a Chablis was a Chardonnay. This is how nothing I knew nothing. <laughs> I was that's, a a real... <laughs> of, that's a lot of nothing. Yeah. <laughs> that's the saying a lot. And so, so, you know, look, fast forward, you know, I did the diploma and then I decided to do the MW purely because I knew no one in the wine industry. And I thought it'd be a good way of having colleagues because I was working by myself. I was, I basically, I just stopped my, my commercial career, I would say. And then I, I was doing jobs in bars and so on just to, you know, uh, support yourself, support myself and learn about wine. So, so then I entered the MW. And I actually loved it. I thrived. You know, I did really well. I passed, I would say, actually, you know, I wouldn't say easily because I, I, I worked my ass off. You know, I, 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 I was up at 6 a.m. working before work at 9 and then in the evening every single weekend pretty much for four years. So, you know, it was, it was, a, and anybody who's been through this, you know, will, will relate. So it was, it was really hard work. Um, but as I progressed in these studies, and this is where I kind of became a lot more attached to natural wine, was I, I realized that, you know, the wine industry is just an industry about crunching numbers, producing wines, trying to sell your wines, being good at marketing, you know, spreadsheets and, and, and all that. But there was no farming really for me. I couldn't really get a sense that actually wine is a farming product. And so what I did is I, I started then in parallel researching more about, you know, smaller growers. I, I became friends with, you know, people like Nicolas Jolie. And then I really understood that, you know, there was basically a very small parallel wine industry that was farming organically. Uh, you and know, doing it for and doing, many years. And been doing it for 8,000 years. Yeah. But, you know, it's somehow the, I would say that the, the bigger wine industry, um, you know, the more conventional and very commercially driven, but on big numbers, you know, they, they occupy most of the space on a shelf because obviously it's a bigger production and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but I think as a result, you know, natural wines were kind of in, in the, in the shadow. They didn't get that much of a voice. Um, and I become, I became like, you know, for me, that was just the, the liberation. I, I thought finally I found people I can just, you know, have supper with and have a chat and go in the, go in the vineyards. And that was, you know, that was the moment where I thought this is, this is my, this is, 
this is what I want to be doing. This is like being back at home. And then I became an MW, I think, in 2008. And at that moment, um, the phone started ringing and saying, you know, we've got this job for you. We've got Because I was the first female at that time to become in France to become an MW. There was only three or four of us anyway, French French people. So it was a big deal. There's only a few more, but still still not, not enough. <laughs> and then I said, no, because, you know, gosh, you know, I'm just, I'm just going to work with natural wine. And that's what I did. And every, all my colleagues said, you are crazy. You've worked all these years to be an MW and you're going to throw it away by just working with these wines that no one knows and mostly are faulty. And, you know, there was that whole Did conversation. you ever hesitate for a minute and say? Oh my say, God, no. Your, your conviction was set. But I, I didn't have a choice. You know, I'd already been through the, 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 you know, working, you know, in, in, with, for, for, publishing companies and, and, you know, <laughs> doing, doing spreadsheet numbering and stuff. Right. So I didn't want to do that. And for me, it wasn't, yeah, it, it's just at that time I'd realized that, you know, there is this, these growers are amazing and they, you know, they have, they need a voice and how, how can I contribute to that conversation? And that's just what I did. And it was, it was tough. You know, I've had a lot of hate mail and I've had a lot of people saying I'm a fraud. Uh, yeah, you don't know what Early you're talking on about. You're talking or? Yes, yes, for years, for well, years. Well, because there, there wasn't that acceptance. It still happens. It, a lot less so now. Yeah, I think yeah. now I mean, we're I think we'll in a talk different, about how it's yes. become more. So you said that was about 2008. So about four years later, you launched, was it the first yes. fair? Yeah. What? When did the idea come? It didn't come four years later and a day before the fair. When did you realize, <laughs> hey... I have a better way to even yeah, help these guys. Absolutely. So you know, in back back then, you know what the what jobs I were doing. I was I was helping um, restaurants. I was building wine lists. I I I, I got taken on by a very good friend of mine, uh, who's Claude Bozzi, who's a Michelin star chef, Michelin star chef, who at the time had a two star Michelin restaurant, and said, "Look, I want to transform my wine list." You know, and we were the first Michelin star at, at the time to just go pretty much fully natural uh, back uh, in two thousand eight nine. Um, so I did a lot of a lot of that, and then in order to obviously educate myself and learn more, I would just travel to all the fairs happening in France. You know, um, La Dive Bouteille was a big inspiration. Vin Nature uh, in in Italy was a big inspiration. So I would go there and just taste with the growers and and learn because they were not so much in the UK that much. And I thought, hey, why don't we have that in the UK? Because the 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 scene is there. It's was not huge. It's still not huge. You know, the the UK is a, is a bit of a a weird market for that, but I thought, let's just do something. And this is how, in 2011, first of all, I created an event called the Natural Wine Fair, and I brought in all the importers at the time who were key on the natural wine place. It was five of us. And I said, let's just, you know, so I approached them, I brought them on board and I said, we need to do something. And they were like, oh, okay, okay, let's try. And then we created the Natural Wine Fair, year one. That didn't really work out. I think there was just, you know, I think bringing people from the natural wine world is incredibly <laughs> difficult, as I realized, because, you know, people don't really necessarily, because everybody's so, so strong. So year two, then I created Raw Wine, um, and th that's how it was born, basically. And then the grower said, oh, my God, this is amazing. This was really the first fair, I think, that was... You know, where it was really professional, we we had a great space, great light, great, you know, everything worked. We we, we were also championing transparency, which we still are. We're still the only one to do that, where we, I ask all the growers to give us, you know, analysis of all their wines that they're presenting at the fair. We publish those results on our website. So we're fully transparent. Um, and the growers love that because, you know, if you right. don't add anything or you add a bit, people just... You know, they want to know if it's zero zero. Or these added sulfites, or so. right. and we're the only ones doing that. And then they said, "Come, let's go to Berlin. Let's go to New York." And and this is how it grew. Was it hard to coax <laughs> the trade, like on those first fairs? I mean, w w how much was natural wine on the map as far as wine pro programs, even in like the hipper restaurants? I it mean, was really hard. I mean, this is a completely, and I think this is what something which is quite hard to comprehend. I think when you've been there. I would say, you know, I mean, I was not at the, there at the beginning, which is where really things started in the 80s, I would say, properly as, as, a, as, a, as a movement. But, you know, 20, 15, 20 years ago, things are still, or f yeah, 15 years ago, things were very different back then. So, you know, the first fair I organized, I had all the hardcore uh, natural wine drinkers and and the trade, but that's it. You know, it was very confined to 
you know, the same people, that, that little right. bubble. I mean, it was very busy, but, you know, it was just basically all the people you knew. And from the very beginning, you know, I had a very clear, I guess, strategy. And the way, who I wanted to reach for the fair was not the wine industry. I actually completely gave up on the wine industry because I thought, the wine industry is not going to cause the change. You were going after the consumer? So I was going after the consumer. To push yes. up to the industry, yes. right? So, so I wanted the consumer to drive this movement. And I really think to this day that, that it's was not the, right. the industry that's driven this movement. It's the consumer that's driven this movement. And I also went after the, um, the food industry. So I, I invited all the chefs, all the people who do the, you know, the, the I don't know what you call them, people who, you know, the, 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 um, the the front staffing and the waiters the the the, the wine sommeliers but also people who did the dishes and who did the pastry right, the whole front and back invited, of the house yeah back of house everybody. front of house I invited everybody it was like come on guys you need to come because natural wine has to be sold in a restaurant really first and foremost because you have to tell the story so that was from the beginning there was very much sort of how how, how I I grew our I guess our yeah. audience well obviously it worked. Mm-hmm. Um, I want you to explain something to me. <laughs> it's I wouldn't say it's awkward, um, but I wouldn't <laughs> pose it to a lot of people because um, it it's such a a fluid topic or term, and that's how you define natural wine. And one of the reasons I'm asking the question is, you know, like I said, when I was prepping, I'm pulling everything out, the book and everything, and I've had a million people talk about it, but, you know, I have Isabel here, so she's not getting out of the room without, you know, talking to me, but the title of your book, and this is where I got confused, Natural Wine, an Introduction to Organic and Biodynamic Wines Made Naturally, okay? I mean, I read it cover to cover years ago, and I, I may or may not know the answer to this, but are there organic and or biodynamic wines that are not natural? As far as how, I, I want you, you to tell me that, because natural wine's a BS term in a sense. That's the sort of open thing. Organ- but but t- there's <laughs> those three. It's a great question. Yeah, yeah, I mean, help me navigate that. <coughs> no, excuse me. And I've been on the road for a long time, so now I'm at, my voice is going. Um, not a long time, but a week, but it's, been t- it's taken months to prepare this, this, this few days. This is a great question, Sam, and I'm actually really happy you're asking me because, you know, the title of my book took me a long time to put together, and I know it sounds like... To oh, figure out the actual title? Yes, yes. Because like you were painting you, over it? Absolutely, <laughs> for a long time, because I wanted to find a way of expressing and talking about the growers who primarily farm organically and biodynamically. You know, this is the most important part of, of this conversation. You know, 90% of what we're drinking is made in the vineyard. We're going to talk about that. But, okay, thank thank you. Um, but at the same time, is how do we how do we basically... Talk about the fact that they may naturally, which is why I picked it very carefully to say it's it's, it's it was organic and biodynamic wines made naturally because you can have organic wines and you can have biodynamic wines if you look at the certification uh, in place for for both. Um, I would say you know um, um, ways of, of of farming and making wine, where you know in organic in organic wines, for example, in the US, you can't add sulfites, but you can actually add yeast. Okay, which is something that when you make wine naturally, you don't add yeast. Um, you can sterile filter. You can do actually a lot of processes um, to, to 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 the wines. If you're in 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 the in Europe, you can add yeast. You can add sulfites up to I think it's about it's, I think it's 100 ppm for reds and 150 ppm parts per million of total sulfites um, in in white wine. So you can add that. You can you can also add, you know, dozens of additives in organic organic certification. So that doesn't guarantee you that you're drinking something which has been made naturally. And then biodynamic is, is the same. You know, you can add, I think, you know, for me, quite elevated levels of sulfites. Uh, again, I think it's 110 ppm for, for Demeter. In parts of, in different parts, you can add, for example, yeast rather than native fermentation for, for, for a biodynamic Certification. You can also certain uh, like Budiva, I think, allows um, they allow um, machine harvesting, which is something that we right. we, we don't hand allow in, in our yeah. So we, we obviously would like people to handpick for for, for 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 different reasons. Not always. Not everybody can actually handpick because of economical and staffing reasons and so on. But that's a different debate. So you know, it's really important that we add this 
this uh, adjective uh, natural to organic and biodynamic because it's not always a given. But it's very confusing and I really get that. You know, I think this is one of the reasons why I'm, I want to be, us to be so transparent at Raw Wine is because when you're a consumer, you're out there, you pick up a bottle of wine and you actually have not got a clue as to how, how wine is made. Right. Um, so is- just to the answer to that question, by being dynamic, biodynamic, is definitely following rigid guidelines, but in a sense, if not done naturally, there were things you could do as a biodynamic farmer that really don't fit your list of what a natural wine is. Yes, there's some elements. I mean, look, don't get I mean, me it's wrong. it's better than non bi yeah, Well, exactly. Yeah, I'm not you know, looking to yes, make it negative. Yes. I'm looking Lori to clarify amazing. so people yes. understand, yeah. you know. For me, na- na- natural is is going a step further, but it, it govern, governs the, 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 the seller. And if I was to <sighs> narrow it down in one, one word, you know, it's about living. So, you know, when you're an organic and biodynamic farmer, or permaculturist, you know, I mean, you, there are many schools of, of thought, but when you farm your, 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 your vineyards, promoting ecosystem and, 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 a, and living soil, this is what we're talking about. And actually... So let me set that. I have a segue. Let me set oh, that sorry. up. because No, no, no. How would you know? <laughs> so to that point, which I cut you off, but you're going to jump back in, um, I think People are becoming more aware, you know, through you and just, you know, educating themselves that great wine is very much about mm-hmm. proper farming and focusing on the importance of the plant, uh, you know, what we do to make these plants thrive. Um, and that's, as you said, the most mm-hmm. important part, you know, of making wine comes out of the field. So as you were going to get into that, you know, a little for me about the importance of the plan and thriving and the focus on it. Yeah, it's, it's, um, and in fact, I don't know if you're, if, if, if you're, if you're, if, if you know, but you know, um, I, I, um, I just, I, I did, um, a, a, a radio series for the BBC on world service, uh, all about, uh, soil, you know, life in the soil, the understory. We did four apps. One of them was actually recorded in, in California while I was doing uh, the last uh, Los Angeles fair in in, uh, in April. And that was, you know, it's four apps and it's all about talking about how amazing soil is because we, we walk on it, you know, we take it for granted and we ruin it. We don't really cherish it. And I really wanted to do something that was focusing on that. So so that's on, 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 the, on the BBC at, at the moment. But the so you do all this amazing work in in the vineyard and then and then it's very easy the minute you bring everything into the cellar to to not preserve the living you know it's very easy to use so much sulfites that you kill bacterial uh fung- fungi life you know the 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 yeast, the yeast. Uh, inside inside that must uh, you can sterile filter it you can also stunt it by by co- chilling your your wine right, right down to you know minus uh, temperature so there is a lot you can do in the cellar and and that thing of me of made naturally at the end of that book uh <laughs> title is about preserving that life in 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 the cellar and that's why and that's why i said to you you know at the beginning of the show is that Natural wine is about a headspace and a heart space. And people who love animals, who love life, who are very respectful of nature, they, you know, for them, it's actually quite an easy, it's easy to be natural. And there's no other way because, because this is where your values are. You know, when I see, when I see, you know, I, 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 I'm a huge, nature and animal lovers. I have three dogs and they, <laughs> you know, I, I, I always, miss not spending enough time just being with them because there's such a big lesson in love. Um, and when I see people who are not treating their, their, their animals or farm animals, you know, properly, I just, I don't like the, the kind of human beings that they are. Right. Um, and, and everybody I meet, uh, all the growers who pour natural one, who make natural one really properly, they, you know, they are huge uh, lovers of nature, and that's why it's. Uh, and and of course, you're then you're going to respect the living because, as you know, we are very small and insignificant in the much bigger picture. Um, and and a vine is alive. You know, a vine has feelings. They can see. They can sense when the disease is coming into the vineyard. They can communicate with the next door neighbor via their root system. They're incredibly smart, um, and they're brilliant at communicating. 
But as human beings, we just feel that we're being very superior and we have we show no respect most of the time for, for the living world. Um, and, and so I think the respect for the living, for me, this word living is, is really fundamental as a, as a tenet of, as a, as a philosophy of, of, you know, of life. Yeah. It's interesting because uh, we're doing a speaker's corner with Le Puy and, you know, they've been at that game for a while. But when you talk about their property, they have this huge property for making wine, and then they have this surrounding property with forests and animals to thrive on, you know, that whole thing for soil health and environment. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that polyculture or is polyculture too narrow of a term? I mean, I mean they, they are, they are biodynamic uh, farmers that they, they are. Yeah, they, 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 I would say they are a polyculture farm because they, they have some, there's so much going on. They also use a lot of, you know, uh, they use their horses. Their right. horses are their friends. You know, they do some work in the vineyard with them. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, they're an amazing example, Le Puy. And I was there actually recording for the BBC because we did um, um, some work with them um, in, in June. And they, the property is amazing. You know, it's been, it's been in the same family and it's been farmed the same way for 400 years. You know, it's crazy. So no, at no point in which happened in Europe in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, did they get pulled into the, the, this dream of the Green Revolution, you know, where right, you have to just... Right, after the war, like typically yeah, many did. <clears throat> with, you know, adding more f uh, synthetic fertilizers because you, you want more yields and then do, using weed killer, which, I mean, my, my family is a big a big culprit. You know, my, my dad would come back home and he would be covered in well, chemicals. You, you mentioned that earlier. I mean, we probably could do a whole show on that because <laughs> yeah. it's counter to everything, you know, you're doing now. Yeah. But, oh, but I think it's, it's a big drive. It's a big drive. And, and yeah. And you know, I used to be at war with with my brother, who's now changing. And and my I put my my nephew with Olivier Cousin to do um you know some to 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 learn a lot more and and to do an internship. So, are they listening so things to you? Are, yeah, things are changing a lot. Thing, but it's taken it's taken a lot of a very angry dinners and not speaking for very much for a very long time. But <laughs> um, but you Le Puy, so Le Puy is a brilliant example, and I think they really and and what's amazing about Le Puy is, is that they are in a very you know now people don't really like. Bordeaux and it, you know because we've there's been a huge backlash after the all the all this really pretty terrible border that we're getting through um and they you know and they they've they've had it tough and now they're they're you know things are changing and now they they are really selling and they are growing and they are you know I mean but they've been kind of been making the, the wine the same way uh, well it's forever. that it's the story the consistency people you know will seek it out even though they got pushed aside being categorized you know in bordeaux um you and i could probably do a show on climate change but you know when you look at you know raw wine the festivals the wineries you work with i mean hasn't that changed the way everybody is growing and making their wines i mean are they planting earlier later freeze uh you know i obviously i think a lot about it and i'm i'm actually you know i'm normally the eternal optimistic and i've I always bounce back you know i've got the energy of a dog for that but um you're feeling it now i i i I don't, I don't, you know, I think it's a little bit too late for, for really to change the course of what's going on, that's for sure. Um, but in terms of what can we do now in terms of, you know, making, you know, trying to obviously change things, we can do our part, you and I, by, by, by promoting organic farming because in terms that, you know, lowers you know, carbon footprint because you trap the carbon in, in, in soil, which is worked properly rather than plowing and releasing all this carbon in the atmosphere and then pollution and so on. Um, in terms of where do you plant now? And I, I think, I, I, I'm not sure there's an answer because wherever you look, you know, you have either too much water, hell, you have frost, uh, you have drought, you know, I think wh whichever corner of the, of the, of the winemaking producing world, there, there is, it's there is a challenge, you know, that needs to people be people are moving up the mountain or the hill. You know, England that, is becoming a sparkling yes. wine haven. I mean, there's <laughs> all course. these very there's a lot of things changing, tangible, you know, noticeable absolutely. changes. Yeah, no, absolutely. But they, uh, these regions, uh, they all come with their own, you know, challenges anyway. And things are changing, even in England. You know, things are challenging. Uh, we're getting a lot of storms and a lot of wind, and you, you know, things that were not really there before. Um, so I'm not sure there is necessarily. I don't really necessarily have, have the answer. I mean, of course, very obvious. I guess 
steps are to focus back on grape varieties that are adapted to the climate. You know, why in California do we still see so much Cabernet Sauvignon and Pinot Noir and grape varieties that, you know, really should never have been planted and planted wherever they are. So there they are, you know, things that the landscape has has to change because there are some some vines that are a lot more, um, as we know, you know, drought, drought resistant. But I think, I think you kind of answered the question because by promoting and supporting these growers through the fairs, you know, through everything you do, the BBC thing, those are the guys that are practicing things that are preserving um, more than, you know, other people, you know, mm -hmm. soil health, um, you know, everything else. Yeah, so. soil health is a, is, a, is a huge one. You know, I, I, in fact, Derek, Derek from Old World Winery was quoting some, some data whereby, um, I can't remember the exact data, but actually by by you know, no tilling on a, on a global scale would 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 tremendously uh, reduce the 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 the, you know, the carbon emission um, that the soil is, is is releasing. So there 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 are there are things we can do. I mean, one thing that I is my bugbear of the du moment is the, the this craze for clear glass that we're seeing in the natural wine world. Glass is a category it's that huge, yeah. and you know you can't make clear glass from recycled glass. Punto, full stop. This is a very simple <laughs> fact. So stop asking growers to put their wines in a clear glass bottle. They don't want to do it. It's a lot more expensive and it's a lot more expensive for the environment. So, you know, this phase of like we need funky Instagrammable colors, bright oranges. Of course, the wine we're drinking right now has got a beautiful color and yet it's bottled in, in, in a green glass because it's it's the glass that is being used, you know, right. that's used other bottles to, to, to produce right. it. So I think little things also we can contribute to rather than getting lost. And I'm sorry, this is, I'm ranting now, but I feel now we're kind of getting lost in with, with natural wine movement in like, Things have got to be, you know, we've got to sell more and it's got to be Instagrammable. It's, look, look, it's got to look beautiful. It's got to look, you know, in, in this clear glass, it's got to look pink. You know, I think we need to just remember what that means, right. you know, and actually is this what makes the most sense? It's good that you bring that up because, you know, I think that's important. Um, Isabel, we have to take a quick break. Mm -hmm. um, we're talking to Isabel Legeron. Isabel is the uh, creator of Raw Wine. We are in New York, her fair Raw Wine New York is coming this weekend. What's the date? Ninth? It's Sunday, Monday. Uh, um, <laughs> it's very Isabel. Good, very good question. I should we know screwed this up. By no, no, today's the ninth. It's no, it's the, tw <coughs> it's the 13th and the 14th. Uh, of um, of November. So it's 13th this, and 14th of yeah. November. That's Sunday and Monday. Monday. We're talking on Wednesday. So if you listen to this in the next few days, um, you'll have an opportunity. Um, we'll tell you how to find it and where to go. So you're listening to The Grape Nation on the Heritage Radio Network. We'll be right back. This episode is brought to you by Roberta's, home of Heritage Radio Network for 10 years. Roberta's was founded in Bushwick in 2008 and has become one of the most iconic restaurants in the country. HRN made its home inside of Roberta's in 2009, and together they have become part of the DIY fabric of the neighborhood. Roberta's, the pizza restaurant, is open for lunch and dinner seven days a week and serves much more than just the famous wood-fired pizzas. Their team dreams up new salads, pastas, and sandwiches on the regular. Roberta's Tiki Bar is alive and well in the back garden, serving up frozen drinks in the summer and hot toddies in the winter. Stop by the bakery and takeout spot next door for fresh breads, sticky buns, and pizzas to go. And of course, there's the two Michelin-starred Blanca tucked away in the garden for truly daring diners. But Roberta's also extends beyond Bushwick, with multiple locations in New York City and now in Los Angeles. You can also find their frozen pies in grocery stores around the country. The spirit of Roberta's, like Heritage Radio Network, is everywhere. Here's to many more years of pizza-powered radio. Learn more about Roberta's at robertaspizza.com. Welcome back. We are back with my guest, Isabel Legeron. Isabel um, and raw wine are pretty much synonymous now. Um, so let's talk about raw wine a little let's get into it let's get people to get the feel all right um so you just arrived like last night or today from la you launched your first fair in the u.s 
Um, and you're pretty much on a tear for like the next month. There's four fairs, including the New York one this weekend, yeah. between now and the end of November. Yeah, five, in fact. I mean, we're not even talking yeah. December. We're talking <laughs> like, you know, the next the next. This is our three. big harvest season, as we call it. You know, we basically we work all year to prepare for this, this month. So, yes, we were in Los Angeles last weekend, and then we have uh, New York coming up this weekend. Afterwards, you know, we fly to Toronto pretty much off the bat. On Wednesday, we have to Toronto, which is the first time we're doing it. Um, you did Montreal. You, so you Montreal, added- yes. And then we're off, off to Montreal. And then we, we have Berlin. Um, but, you know, Toronto is really interesting because in a way, you know, look, if you say to me, does it make sense for you to do an event in Toronto financially? I would say absolutely not. You know, it's taken my team so long to figure out the right venue. The, 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 the complication of the paperwork to work in Canada is... Really? Incredibly difficult, but then Toronto is just on, on another level. Um, you know, the, it's it's a small event by our standards. You know, they will have four or five hundred people turning up. Uh, we have about seventy five growers, so you know, it's it's a very so small that event. Sounds and, no, I know. very viable. I, I know. And Canada is a great. I mean, Montreal is a terrific wine market. Of more course. natural wine. Absolutely. Does no. that? Creep into Toronto too. I mean, does, not not so much. Not I as, think so. You will help create awareness. Yes, I mean, and this is exactly what we're doing it. So we're doing Toronto because, you know, importers, uh, the Living Vine, for example, is is a key importer over there who's been saying to us, please come to Toronto, it would really support us. Um, it's a it's it's a developing market, you know. It's you know, it, I mean, there's now more and more going on. But you know, this is how I see raw wine. This is our our role. You know, we have a an established event, I would say, in New York and in Montreal, um, and then this means that we can actually also support markets like Toronto. I mean, I don't know who else would actually go and do an event in, in Toronto, you know, from an international perspective. Well, now they will. <laughs> I mean, you trailblaze. <laughs> maybe, yeah, I mean, maybe, we know, hopefully. We know there's other fairs, which we <laughs> yeah. may mention. But, but you know, so that's our job. Is My job is, is not to just like, oh, turn up in New York because I know it's uh, an established market. And of course, New York does, would New, does New York really need our, our support or our, our fair? You know, I would say, I would say yes, because a lot of growers are looking for a presentation. And, and even from L.A., people have found a lot of uh, importers and distributors just by coming to L.A. Uh, but, you know, this is also part of the story. You know, it's, it's like it's like supporting nascent, nascent market as well as, you know, basically being in, in, in more established markets. Right. Um, but, yeah, it's a big, it's a big schedule. I don't, I don't want to assume everybody knows everything about raw wine. So tell me two things quickly to get out of the way. Um, the mission of raw wine, and you alluded to it earlier, where the people that participate, you know, have to go through some, you know, criteria and all yes, of that, uh, the, you know, and, and we've been talking all along about what you're doing at the fairs. Um, but let's, let's talk about the fair itself. You walk in and you've thought this through and perfected it. Here's what I want people to experience. So, I mean, you know, from, so from a, I would say the front end experience of, of the fair. Yes, you know, you walk in and it's a very well um, organized event. You know, we have a lot of support from, from you know, we have a, a lot of staff support to help the growers to make sure that there's always ice for them, that the spittoons are always permanently emptied. Um, you know, we, we've developed a technology which doesn't exist anywhere else where we've got this online catalog where you create your 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 own catalog experience you can take tasting notes you can rate the wines you can send yourself some lists you can send a list of your favorite wines to somebody so this is a proper you know technology that has taken us a long time and we've we've created that ourselves um and so you know when you come into the fair there's a, in New York there's about 150 149 growers who they're pouring their wines, you know, that's thousands of wines that you can, you can taste. Every single wine, every single grower has been vetted. So our vetting process, um, is actually, I think quite, you know, it is quite thorough. So people, you know, when we onboard new growers, they have to go through a questionnaire. They have to send us analysis of all their wines. I've got to taste the wines. Um, so, you know, I get a lot of samples and then they have to also be referred to by friends. So uh, they have to give me one or two names of growers I can speak to or we can speak to um, and just ask them about, you know, do you know these growers? Have you been there? And all of that. So all of that, you know, is, is, is guarantees. I mean, you're obviously doing that all year long, right? I mean, you're on a continued mission of 
you know, vetting and tasting new things and offering new people. Absolutely. When you turn up on the day of, I think, and and thank you for actually uh, mentioning that because, you know, I have, I have, you know, I have actually a team who works for us all year round. Um, You know, there's, there's four people who are, I would say, you know, more office based who are now, you know, two of them are with me here. Uh, There's, you know, somebody helping us with social media and I have two full-time web programmers you know, who work on the website all year long to, to develop to keep it, it fresh, to keep it going. Yeah. And then we update the content of all the grower profiles because we have about 50,000 people a month who use our website for information. Sure, so that's resource. actually, that's a resource that has got to be, you know, it's got to be maintained and we don't charge the growers anything for their profiles. So the only revenue we get is, is when they come to a fair. Um, but then that means they, they get a profile literally for life that we, you know, we, we, we upkeep. So, you know, there's a lot that is basically it takes 12 months to prepare for a fair. So that's why when you come in, it feels like, oh, wow, everything is just, you know, it's well organized because, you know, we are, I guess we're pros now. We, we've been doing it for quite a while. Tell, go backwards for a second. You talked about that, I don't know how you describe it, that database or that proprietary thing you developed, that's online? Mm, So So you walk into the festival, you you go online to that, and you could create your own notes, get information, you could send info to friends. Yes, it's uh, it's our online catalog. So It's, um, it's a catalog. We right? are, it's basically before we used to print a catalog, um, which we had to print in the, in, in the UK and, and ship uh, to, to So the to, catalog to the US. info is there and then there's all these things that you could do. Yeah, so what we've done is we've, and, and that, the carbon footprint of that was huge, obviously, because it That's had to be air shipped cool. and we, we printed, you know, literally thousands and thousands of these books. Um, and, and so what we decided is to then, so I had a team develop this for months and then this catalog became an online platform, um, where it's got a different web address. I mean, we're busy now merging both technologies. Um, but it's, it's, and when you go into the fair, you can literally, uh, there's, QR codes, there's big posters, you just click on the QR code, it takes you to this online platform. And this is yours for life. So you create your user profile and you have access to all the catalogs from all the fairs. And literally you see the, so you, it's, it's actually really pretty cool. You can see the whole floor plan. You can click on a table. It takes you to the page with all the information. You can click on a wine. Um, That's and then the you, way to do it. You put all your, all your, all your notes, you rate it. Um, and then you say, I love it. I don't love it. You know, there's, there's a lot of different ways of, of putting all your, all your information. You can also say, I want to taste all the orange wines of the fair and that pulls you the list. And then that list is there for you forever. All your tasting notes are there from year to year. You can share that with, with friends. Over time, I'd love this to be integrated into our website and made, made public. You know, that would be really amazing, but that's quite, quite a big, a big leap for us to be able to. to so there's to a guy in Seattle, Eric Levine, seller tracker who created mm. this communal where you see other people's right. tasting notes. I mean, there's a lot of differentiations, but in that aspect, there's a community that yeah. interacts peer-to-peer. Yes. You know, I'd rather hear what you have to say about a wine than some reviewer that I may not trust yeah. or whatever. Well, so. that's true also. Uh, but, you know, at the moment, anyway, there's, everything is Sprite, so I don't want people to, you know, worry that we're going to be publishing their notes. This is completely, yeah, this right. is completely confidential. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't think they but worry about it. But it's really cool it. because, you know, it's that, I've never seen anyone do that. That, you know, it's and, and that takes, you know, in fact, Martino, uh, he's, that's what he's doing at the moment. You know, that that takes days and days. I mean, I have two people full time who just call growers to get their profile information because you know what growers are like. They're like in the vineyard, they're harvesting at the moment. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're this farmers. Is like, so the information that people have on our website or on the catalog, I would love people to not take that for granted um, because it a it's coming directly from the grower, so we know it's correct. But it's taken months to collect, you know, and that's a very precious uh, piece of information. What good point? Because when you think of raw wine, you now understand that there's that aspect. You know, when the fair ends, you have notes you could share with friends, and you know, I see your commitment to you know even making it bigger. Um, another and th- transparency. So you know, you said what is what to expect from the fair is is full transparency. So. You know, we know exactly how how a wine is made. 
we declare the total sulfat levels. And again, that's that's something to get that all that that's information. That's label transparency too, specifically. Yeah. And that's all published. So Which you talked know exactly. about a little, you know, yeah. what you can and can't put in. So mm-hmm. the transparency part, so everyone can understand, you know, what's in the wine. Um, and there shouldn't be a lot in reality. Be. For, for us, it's only sulfites. Right. You know, that's right. it. Um, but I do, and I do on that point, if I, if I could just add one sure. thing, you know, because I know I've had comments and criticism by saying, uh-huh. oh, you know, you're, because we've got a very strict, excuse me, we've got a very strict charter of quality. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things in our char- charter of quality is wines can have a, um, a total parts per million of up to 70, 70, 70 ppm for across all styles of wines. Um, and when you know that Demeter pushes it up to 110. Or this organic is sulfur, certificate. sulfites? Yes, yeah, sulfites. Right. Yeah, sulfites total, 70 ppm. And yes, so on the, and for me, that's too high. Personally, I don't actually drink wines that have 70 ppm. You know, I keep my levels to 30, 40 max and then anything under in. And ideally, I just drink sulfite free wines. But, you know, I also understand that it's a journey. You know, sulfite is not the whole thing. The whole conversation sulfites right. is just an additive. You know, don't just, let it come to just yeah. the sulfide yeah, argument. Yeah, we've just focalized our right. because it's easy. We can talk into numbers, but you know, when you know that somebody's farming amazingly, they're bringing their grapes, uh, harvesting manually. They only they they ferment everything naturally, and then it, it for them it's more comfortable to add sulfides. And I think we should respect that. You know, because it's a journey, and I and and then people year after year after year. You know, they, 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 they use less and less because they're more and more comfortable. And I think that's way more important. You know, it's also a journey for everyone. And what do we want? Do we want to keep the natural wine conversation to 150 growers who work 00 to 100 growers or 300 growers around the world? And that's it? Or are we trying to bring everybody in because our ultimate goal is to change the environment? This right. is what we're trying to do That's here. That's the bigger That's big the picture. big picture yeah. because this is, you know, we're in a crisis stage now and that we we need we, we need we need everybody con- to convert to organic farming. Um to that point you've always brought um education into the fairs. Um you've done it via seminars and speakers. Um you know, as a matter of fact, for years in a row I'm excited to moderate two panels. We talked about Harold and Le Puy from Bordeaux, and we're going to get into Slovakian natural wines. I think the last one we did wines from Dalmatia. I know, yeah. <laughs> and terrific wines. And, you know, so I'm excited and everyone should be. Um, and thank you for, for always being up for it. You know, you're always so excited to be moderating these talks. And, and, and it's great because having a brilliant moderator and somebody like you who's so... You're too kind. No, but it's true. You know, honestly, it's about, it's about carrying people along, letting them tell their story. I just keep them, you know, going in the right direction. But I, 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 I and, mean, it, yeah. it, kudos to you. I mean, Lapui is very interesting, and you know, Slovakia, yeah, Eastern Magula Europe, is are, also you know, really they're interesting making very story. cool wine. So to, to yeah. get into that, we did kombucha last year, which was you know, <laughs> know cool. Yes. You know, keep it coming and all that. <laughs> yeah, but um, Magula, you know, the Slovakia story is really interesting, and we're about to release actually a big piece that we've been writing about. About Magula, but also about about all the growers, because there's quite a few of them now uh, who come to you know who come to the fairs, and and these regions are fascinating to me because you know when you're in France or in in Italy, you haven't had to contend with a, an a, an upheaval of a political situation where people came in and actually took your land away, um, and took your technology away, and took your we talk about away. sulfites. How about dealing with that? Exactly. Right? Forget about like yeah, fifty really. ppm. <laughs> it's yeah. like. <laughs> It's nonsense. And so I think, you know, these, so that's why I'm actually really excited about talking, you know, you having a conversation with, with, with Vlad and, and, and his, his story and his family story, because it's heartbreaking to know what's happened, but it's amazing to hear that, you know, in the end, you know, he's really embracing the, the tradition is going more, you know, when I met, when I met Val, Vlad a few years ago, you know, he wasn't particularly natural. He was struggling with filtering and sulfites. And I remember he was saying to me, you know, I'm really struggling because this is not what my dad, dad or my family wants me to do. And they're really pressurizing me into doing something else. And so these people, what am I going to supposed to do? Am I supposed to say to Vlad, well, tough, you know, Vlad, just come back in a few years when you're ready. Or should I say to him, don't worry about it. I, I understand. In fact, my family was exactly the same. Come, you show what you can show. And over the years, it's a progression. And look at where he is now. And everybody's been in that same boat. And that's why it's really important to open the door 
that that's a great story. Um, I'm anxious to talk to him. Um, just so people understand, I mean, you go to this fair, and like you said, in New York, 150 producers, multiple wines. You know, the winemakers themselves are there. I mean, it's an incredible experience. But talking about this education part and the speaker's corner, you've kind of carved away a spot, a room, you know, for 30, 40, 50 people, depending, talking about a specific subject with wines. Like, if you're lucky enough to get into the Lapui thing early, you're going to sit at a table and you're going to taste four vintages of Bartholomew, yep. you know, separate of walking the floor and having the winemaker talk to you. Do you remember, when did you start doing these sit-down seminars? From the very beginning. You did? Yeah. You yeah, just year thought, one. I'm here, they're mm. here, let's let's do it. Always. I mean, <laughs> I remember awesome. the, first, the first London fair, I think we had Jonathan Nosita. Uh, you the, know, the film the director. New York sommelier who became a the film director. Yes. Mondovino. Mondovino. And he and he and uh, we had Mondovino at at the fair. You know, we 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 hired a special room and uh, a projector and we we showed, you know, the movie and there was a QA. We've done all sorts of crazy things. Um always because I think, you know, edu- I, I mean education is, I think sometimes it can be a big word and people feel a bit sort of I don't know. Um, what, you know, wary of it or, or terrified or, 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 or intimidated is the word I was looking for. But, you know, it's important to, rem- to, to, to remember that back to this, what's going on on Instagram right now, where s- wines are selling just because they look pretty and luminous. Um, right, orangey. With, and orangey and pink, bright pink, and <laughs> right. everything has to be cloudy. Um, we need to really just focus back on, 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 the, on, on farming. And for that, you know, there's no better way than listening to somebody talk to you for an hour um, to realize it takes so much effort to make this wine. Maybe we need to also give time to people who look a bit more traditional, who have a bit of more of a traditional label uh, because they don't care about marketing and they don't have somebody to help them. on. on on, They don't have a friend who's a painter who can do funky labels. You know, they just do a very, very conventional looking label. It doesn't mean the work is not there. No, no, no. You know, and I think that's why these, these, uh, these speakers corner are are important. Um, So there'll be three panels. Um, You're doing a panel too. Um, we will direct people to the website. They'll be able to get more information. Um, one thing I wanted to talk to you about, and it's been going on for not that long, you recently launched a wine club. Um, there's a lot of wine clubs out there, but when you think about who do I want to trust to pick, if I'm going to commit to a club, <laughs> who am I going to trust to pick? So you'll tell me more, but I'm guessing between your expertise and the exposure to all these great winemakers, which aren't necessarily as available, you put a club together, mm. which does what? That? Mm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, look, you know, I'm not going to lie. The, the, I had the headspace to think about the club because of the pandemic. Uh, you know, for suddenly for two and a half years, you know, it's like you've got the carpet pulled out from underneath your feet. I, you know, we did nothing. Um, and still I had my team and I, I didn't want to let go of anyone. So I was trying to think of, of, of ways. And, and so one thing we did is we built um, a shop, an online shop for the UK. And we have about a thousand wines on, you know, in, in, in that shop. So we're the largest selection of, of natural wines. And um, and these the, are the your UK. raw wine. They're all part of the raw you're wine part, website. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, people that come to the fairs, yes. people, you know, who yeah. are on the so site. So we're supporting the community. And also we had, we when when we pulled London in 2020, five days before the event, everybody had sent their samples. So we put all the samples online and we sold them all on behalf of the growers. So tell me how the club works. I'm so the club is different. So yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah. there's so an the online club, store and yeah. there's a club. <laughs> so the club launched in April. But let's not, we'll come back and clarify sure, sure, that. Sure, but, but the club. Yeah, so the club launched in, in, in April. And it's actually very simple. And like you say, you know, I actually have access to tasting wine. You know, I taste wine all the time. I mean, that's just what I do when, when I'm not on the road. Um, so... And so many people are always asking me, can you make some recommendations and da, da, da. So I thought, let's just bring everything together. So what I do is, so I personally, and I've had people email me say, you can't possibly be picking all the wines for your own club. I was like, well, who else is it going to be doing it? Yes, I taste every single thing. Um, so I taste a lo- load of wine and I pick, you know, things that I think would work really well that month. Um, and then we, so it's six wines. 
it's $200, $199, uh, including the shipping. We shipped to about 40, 42 states, I think, or 45 states. Sorry, I shouldn't, <laughs> shouldn't know that. But yeah, and in fact, now we can ship even to Hawaii. Um, and so I pick every single wine. Uh, the wines are all raw wine growers, of, of course. Then we do an in-depth interview with every single one of them about how they made the wine, which so is all available. there's a lot of education There's a lot of intel. content. Then there's nice. my tasting notes on, on this. And then the members, they get... You know, a postcard with a QR code, it takes them to that page of that month with all the grower interviews. And, you know, that, that, that's, somebody spends days doing that. Uh, I don't interview them personally, uh, but I, I draw the questions and things, but then somebody else d- does the interviewing and, and tr- transcribing. And, and, and that's it. And, you know, to give you a little flavor, um, of what's being shipped tomorrow, cause it gets shipped on the 10th of each month. Uh, we have a, a pet nut from Germany, from Piri, from a really lovely young female grower, uh, who's not been doing it for, 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 for very long. I think, I don't know how many vintages, but I think it's her second or third vintage. We have Andy Weingart, also from, Fangan, also from Germany, really crisp white. We have a beautiful, um, Spanish, uh, white Grenache from Clandestina. We have something from a, a very juicy, easygoing wine from, from Australia, from Gentle Folk, Folks. We have from, Yumbel, from where? Pi- gentle folks from from Australia. Australia. Um, okay. We have Yumbel Pipeño from uh, from 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 Chile, like a beautiful base, quite crunchy. And then we have also uh, from Kunok in New Zealand, uh, Pinot Noir blend and Pinot Noir and Riesling. So it's very eclectic. It's always you know I have a lot of fun. It's very hard to choose six wines per month because yeah, I would it sounds lo- like a maybe. And what's really amazing is the growers are really excited about this because they get an interview. We spend a lot of time with them. They get really nice exposure. People understand more about their work. So it's a real win-win. Oh, you know? yeah. I mean, it, it really so is. I, I have a lot of fun. Technical questions. Six wines a month. You threw the price out. Do I have to commit to the year or do I jump in and out? I mean, tell me. You, you, you're in control. So you can do every month. You can do every two months, every three months. You can pause okay. it look, because people travel, you know, right. and then and they'll just, you go into your profile, you pause it, you do whatever you want. You also have a lot of add-ons. So, you know, 70 bottles may be too much for somebody if they yeah. do it every month, but they want to be exposed um, to. Yeah, yeah, you do what you want. You just basically six every So month that's or, the wine club, which is a very curated thing. The online thing is a larger opportunity to be exposed to and buy a whole multitude of wines, right? Yeah. So the, the, the online shop is, is you know, we have a, a near a, a, on a thousand different wines for sale. It only services the UK because it's, it's ship, ships out of the UK. Um, and Do you aspire to be in the States or it's just too difficult? <laughs> I mean, may, maybe, you know, yeah. but then that becomes a bit, slightly bigger beast, especially if you, if you want to be able to have a decent inventory, you know, right. in terms of cash flow and all of that is, 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 would be a different problem. So uh, I think, you know, I mean, maybe the club is a way of testing, you know, the yeah. market and then maybe over time we could, yeah. we could the grow club it sounds for sure. Terrific. Um, because it's you picking the wines and it's a very specific you know, area wine, which, you know, is out there, but your access to it. Surprisingly, the club, I have a lot of industry people. Like, I I was very surprised. Oh, I would think so. Yeah, it's mostly industry. You know, know, I'm in the industry. How do I get those wines? I'm getting them through you. I'm not necessarily going to have access to them. So here's exposure, tasting, education, and, you know, so I think it's terrific. Especially if you're you're located in a part of of the U.S. where you don't necessarily Right, I take it for granted because I'm the typical ethnocentric New York where this is the center (laughs) of the universe. But that's not the right call anyway. All right, so... um, I don't want you to leave without doing two things, uh, answering my wine list, which you've done in the past, and I want to talk about a wine that's very representative of what the fair is about. But we talked about this offline, and I just want you to address it for a second. Um, you mentioned you were inspired by natural wine fairs and salons, you know, where you said, gee, this doesn't happen in London. Fast forward, you know, to now, 10, 12, 15 years later, there's sort of been a proliferation of fairs. Um, you know, I'm a pretty competitive guy, so I'm like, well, I don't need those guys up my back. But you know what? The more, to, the better. I, I mean, tell me, you know, how you feel about it. As long as everyone does it right, that's one thing. Yes, I, I think it's great. Um, honestly, you know, particularly when you're in a place like New York, it's a huge city. Um, you know, obviously the natural wine scene is, is, is a little bit sm- smaller, um, but it's a big city. There's 
you know, there is there is definitely space for for a lot more than just you know our fair. You know, at the end of the day, we have 150 growers. We might get two or three thousand people come. You know, it's it's a smallish affair in 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 you know I would say New York terms. Um, I think it would it could be better planned um, because I you know like I know that over these next few days is maybe five or six. Sort of everyone should compliment, not feed off of I, each so I, other. Yeah, I, I feel it's every, there's this, everything. So it feels very crowded over, over, over five, six days, and everybody's kind of seems to be choosing their dates to sort of to be either the day before, the day after, on the day of, um, and and that's that's fine because, like I said, there is there is definitely space for 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 but everyone. You, you made a good point. People and people in the industry only have a certain amount of disposable time. So and as much as yeah. you'd like to do mm. everything, you physically you can't. can't. Yeah. So this is this is my only regret is that I I know and we release our dates a year in advance and and I and I'm always super careful. You know, I have a spreadsheet where I plot every single fair happening around the world. Keep an eye on everything. And I make and whenever something's in a, and I make sure I never clash. Um because because a, the growers, you know, they, some growers would love to be able to attend more, but they have to make a choice. And then industry, particularly in November, where everybody's busy, we're preparing for, for the festivities, Thanksgiving, Christmas, you know, actually time is very limited Holidays, and I'm very, sure. you know, conscious of that. And so by, you know, asking somebody in the industry to come to one day of a tasting, but two days of a tasting or maybe three days or four days is actually impossible. So, you know, I, I think maybe everything should be spread around the year a bit more. That would give, uh, you know. I, I think be, that's fair. So, you know, you know, I think the more the merrier, but, you know, if you could space it out or, you know, time it out. I agree with that. Because for somebody like me who I feel important to be exposed to that, I can't get to everything. You know, I don't have the time and I would like to, you know, unless it seems silly, try everything. So yeah, you'd like uh, to be supportive of everybody. Yeah. yeah of and course. taste everything mm. and meet everyone. Mm. You know, my thing is a podcast. I'm looking for a story. You get to stand across from a guy. You go, Holy cow. This guy's amazing. You know, because um, to me, it's as much about the story as the wine now. All right, Isabel, nobody leaves without doing our wine list. We have five questions. Let's do this quickly. Don't dwell on it. Don't fixate <laughs> on it. Move quickly because I got to get you out of here. And I want to taste this wine and I want you to talk about it. So this is a tough question to ask you. It's maybe one of the easiest questions. But the first question is always, what are you drinking now? What's in your fridge at home? You know, what are you trying? Did the change of seasons move you from one wine to another? Mm. How does business affect, you know, what you have to taste? And, and, you know, like I said, you're knee deep in it like no one else. So, you know, look, look, I brought a bottle of Chilean wine uh, from L.A., um, and and I think actually Chile is a good is a is a good place to start because I don't know about in the US but I get a feeling it's a little bit similar um, in 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 the UK they're suffering from a really bad reputation of cheap boring reliable wines you know I think Chile is not a place where you think of wow I'm going to drink something which is going to be really sophisticated and 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 really inspiring and yet you know they there are. A tremendous diversity and a multitude of natural wine producers in, in in Chile. You know, the scene is recent. I would say it's it's a ten year old process. Uh, maybe some growers have been doing it for you know like mid to 2000, 2003 with Herrera Alvarado, for example. But um, I think Chile is a, is a really great place to to explore natural wines. Um, you have a wealth of ancient. Great varieties that are ungrafted. You know, the, the, the Pais is a brilliant example of, of, of this grape that's been there for 500 years. You still have these ancient vineyards, particularly in the south. You know, tremendous terroir, tremendous terroir expression, granite, volcanic. Um, you know, obviously the Pacific uh, influence, brilliant uh, farming and, and, and natural winemaking. So I'm very excited for It sounds for, for pretty Chile. ideal. It's, it's like it ticks all the boxes, honestly. And you have... It looks like at least a dozen Chilean producers. Yeah, probably more now, and at, they're very affordable. The yes, yeah. yeah, so we have loads, and and the reason why we have loads is because the government is 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 helping them uh, with you know airfares, uh, with coming to to the US, and they they they're, they're really supporting putting him. And that's something we do a lot of, you know, in the background. Is I am in touch with a lot of organization, government organization in in, in Spain, in Georgia, in Chile. I spend a lot of time with them. How can we support the growers? So we do a lot of admin work in the background to try and 
to try and basically position raw wine as a fair of note and of importance in the international market so they feel they have to support their growers to come. So Chile has a fairly big established commodity wine market and they make some other wines. The government is getting behind these smaller yep, natural guys in yep. addition to, you know, the brand names that we know, which yeah. is terrific. Yeah, they're really into supporting small growers um, we, uh, in coming and getting exposure. And, you know, I was traveling with, um, in fact, from LA to New York with uh, Do Donia Luisa, who's, who's, an, who's a small producer who doesn't have any representation. It's the first time he's ever been to the U.S., and he came to LA. He's got a, uh, now. He's got a distributor for oh, great. LA and New York. Well, that's you know that's so that's, that's our the job. beauty and power of what you yeah, can offer. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. I'm still amazed when I go, you know, to raw wine and even other fairs. That some people are making wonderful wines and have no representation, and in most cases they go back with mm. you know something. But that's because we're caught in that also, you know, yeah. because the bottle doesn't look right, because the story does, you know, rather than focusing on okay. And that's one of the things that I, I'm doing with the club is I'm picking some growers who are not that they're brilliant, but they're not that well known. And giving them, you know, well, I a, think a, a, a space. I think that's the beauty that's of the our club. Job. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. where people look to you yeah. to, you know, curate that. All right. Second question is the silliest, and I'm curious how you answered last time. But do you have a favorite wine and food pairing? Not what you think is a good one. What 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 do you like? Like what what works? <laughs> you know, we have a rule on the Grape Nation. You can't say champagne and oysters, okay. which is the classic thing. But what is like you an ooh-ah, <laughs> ooh -ah, you know? Well, look, I mean, I mentioned earlier that I was really into foraging. And when okay. I left, it was the beginning of the Chanterelle season. So and we're I going took, mushrooms somewhere so yeah, here. So I took With Sasha what? It's a very earthy, musky fact, <laughs> food. What, what? Yeah, and I so I took Sasha, my daughter is called Sasha, um, and we went, we picked, you know, probably three or four kilos of Chantorelle, and she's only two and a half, so she's just learning to pick. But she always asks me before she touches anything, Maman, Maman, you know, can I touch it? I say, yes, 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 no, no, no. Um, anyway, we brought them back, and I cooked them uh, very simply with just a little bit of garlic, and we and I opened a bottle of, of in fact, Sasha Radicons, uh, Ribola Giala, 2010, uh, which so was just uh, really amazing. Forage fresh mushrooms, sautéed with a little garlic, simple, with Sasha Radican's Ribola Gialla. Yeah, from 2010. And it was very, um, I mean, you know, very mellowed because, you know, the, 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 the wine used to be a pretty, I mean, it's, it's always a lot of VA and it's, it's a very explosive wine. Uh, but it was like now going into a very mineral uh, phase restrained, but and wonderfully that, that earthy. Works well it was great. It, it was it was amazing. But you know, I'm not a big, and I've probably said that to you last time you asked me the question. Is I don't really ever think about food and wine pairing. Really, I just. It's you know, funny how some people, you, it's like that. Mm, you know, a juicy burger and cabernet, and other people can't answer the question. At least you have an answer, but it, it's it's not an important thing. It's it's a good answer because the reality of the answer is an interesting pairing. Mm. And that's... It was just an age, you know, I was lucky enough that I had yeah. a, a bottle yeah, case a while ago. I was lucky enough that at one of our speakers' corners, I got yeah, to sit with Sasha, and I think we had about eight, ten wines. Oh, God. That may have been one of the greatest, yeah. you know, raw wine speaker corners. Yeah, and, and, and Lorenzo Corino as well, do you remember? God rest who his left soul, us? of course. Yeah. I may meet up with Sheila, his old distributor. Yeah, yeah she's coming to New York, yeah. that's right. Mm. All right, third question. I think you can answer this, and by answering it, you're not excluding anyone or whatever. But in London and New York, do you have like a favorite wine restaurant or bar, people that do it well, that have the list, that are knowledgeable, that have the vibe? You know, I know our friend Sev or whatever, <laughs> you know, 10 bells 10 years ago checks that box, you know. So that's kind of the, the – I know. I mean, look, there are – so many places now and I mean in, in, in London one of the places that I think is for me is a very reliable go-to beautiful food and, and you know great wine is, is Elliot's uh, but I also help you know help them curate their list for like 10 years and now they've opened a new spot in East London which is really really amazing and last time we were in London we all went had a big meal there um, and in, in, in New York I mean it's also exploded there's so many different things but the one place that I will never miss is 10 Bells. 
Right. That is the one place. That's kind of why I led you. Because it's I, I mean, you have all the girls are there. And, and I preface the question by saying, I don't want to put you on, the, like, Isabel, why didn't you mention <laughs> us? Or, you know what? This isn't a ranking list or the only thing. These are just, you know, suggestions. And the reason why I, I will never miss them is because, A, they, they, they always are incredibly supportive and they always welcome all the girls from the fair there. So whenever you go there, it's literally, you know, it's it's... You know, it's a mini raw. You know, everybody's there. Well, yeah, and, and I mean, you it's just... kind of ground zero outside of the event <laughs> exactly. for you know. So that's that's meeting the place. up with everyone. You know, even if I had to crawl out of bed because I was really super sick, I always go there for for to hang out and and see everybody. All right, those are good ones. I didn't mention I post these on social media. Fourth question: favorite all time wine. When I initially structured the question, the objective was let me. Ask Isabel the rarest, most expensive wine she's ever drank. I, I don't care about that. Um, and because you've been on the show multiple times, I got to go back and compare. The question really is, what was that wine or two that had an impact on your world, your life, wine, you know, that was a gateway that gave you that aha moment that, you know, re you realized, you know, a region or a varietal. Is there a wine or two that really, you know, resonated with you? Yeah. I mean, look, there's, there are two, I've, I've got, I, I mean, I have a lot, but I can think of two wine moments uh, with growers that really had a huge that I'll st you know, I think about those moments uh, t uh, now. And, you know, one of them is with um, Le Caso de Mayol. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, at the time. Spell that for me. Caso de Mayol. So uh, C A S O T. And then D D E S. And then Mayol is M A I L L O L E S. Caso de Mayol. Um, and I can't remember when it was, but it was really at the very, very, very beginning of, of, of my natural wine journey. And, um, and I visited the Roussillon. Um, and I ended up, you know, uh, Frédéric Grapp, who, who has an import business in, in, in London, who's a very close friend of mine. He was just beginning as well. And he said, you, you must go and see, um, and see Caso de Mayol. Um, and I thought, okay, okay. Like, so I, I went there and, you know, they were doing the, the, you know, they're not, they're no longer running the Casa de Mayol. They passed it on since, uh, 2000, I think maybe 16 was their Is last. Is it Casa uh, de Mayol? Casa de Mayol. they changed the no, name? No, no, still, it's still. It's, it's just, just run them. by somebody yeah. else because yeah. they retired. Right. Um, and, was and it then, friends or family or they kind of sold no, it? No, they kind of, well, they found somebody who worked right. with them for the a few years. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah they yeah. took them a long time. Right. Um, basically. Um, and, and then Gislaine just sort of ended up, um, not doing it and then there's um, Alain Castex then carried on he already had Le Vin des Cabanon and then now that's his, his own project but you know at that moment and I can't remember the year and I would love to but I you know I came to see them they were doing work in the vineyard and I arrived arrived at lunchtime and we sat in their van because the van you know in Banyuls right so where the, the, the vines are clinging on to the to, to the to the to this schistous terraces we're looking at the med it's hot. It's a beautiful day. They are like working so much that, you know, it's because it's very hard work. They're doing everything manually. Anyway, I arrive there. We sit in their van. They bring bottles and we just have a casse-croûte, literally pâté and cheese and bread and, and, you know, and share an incredible moment in, in this van. It was so hot. You'll never forget that. <laughs> I'll never forget that. And then they brought out... Um, they brought out Canta Manana, which is their rosé, which is to this date, you know, I, I buy it every year. I have a, a, quite a healthy. Do the grapes vary or it's made no, with it's, what? It's, it's a blend of red and then there's some muscat. And, uh, okay. but, um, Alain still does it now. Um, and also some white Caso de Mayol. And then we go back to the winery. We taste everything. And then to this day, I would say, you know, this is the, the winery I, I, I have a lot, uh, most of in terms of, all the vintages because I buy it all the time. I just get to it. Age, and it. I was, mean, your connection. It's complete. It was, you know, completely. You know, it was made in a in a rented garage, completely handmade, zero zero. The white is is like a stormy day by the sea. It's salty. <laughs> it's incredible. So that's like one Energetic, thing. Energetic, salty. Yeah, the whole you know, thing. Yeah, and you then could the, feel it. 
Uh, it's 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 really they're they're the most amazing wines, um, full of personality and 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 can age beautifully over over decades. And uh, the I think the oldest one has got I've got is from two thousand and four. And then you know I was very lucky to uh, spend some time with Pierre Auvergnois. Uh, I went there to stay and I spent a couple of days with him and made bread. You know he was he just harvested his his his, uh, his honey, so we you know was just uh, you know uh, putting That's some cool. honey in, jar, in jars. But then he did this amazing tasting. You know he does this if you're lucky enough to be able to attend one of these tastings where you taste a lot of stuff blind. And he was literally pulling things, you know, I had things from the fifties, seventies that he was just literally going, going and then pulling out from from his cellar. And just, you know, there is, you know, I think Auvergnois is obviously the wines have become um, impossible to obviously get hold of and they're they're expensive. Um, And Pierre and Emmanuel and the family, you know, they, they are such a, so, so much to learn, such a, you know, he's, I mean, Pia is the most, one of the most gentle, generous soul um, that I've ever met. It goes um, beyond the wine, which is oh, terrific, but the person and everything. It's not about the wine, it's yeah. just about, yeah. just like the lessons, That's, everything he says, you just makes you think, oh my God, yeah, of course, it's, you're right. And, and, you know, it's, it's, it's almost about like pressing pause on, on your life when you, when you go yeah. and, and spend time there. It's a, um, so it's a wonderful yeah, opportunity. I mean, you know, but I've, you know, I mean, growers, as you know, farmers are incredibly generous and hospitable and have, a, have a lot of well, if, memories. They're kind know. of alone on the farm most of the mm. year. So when you roll in, they're like, let's go, yeah. you know, which is, and you know, if your cousin's parties are legendary, you know, when you go there during the div, and I mean, yeah, there's just a lot of very special moments. And, and I guess that's, you know, yeah, yeah. well, yeah. those are, I'm going to post both of those. Last question. Here's the question, but I'm going to reform it for you. Best wine around 15, 20, 22 bucks American. Recommend a red or a white. So what I'm asking you is what's beautiful about the wines that you represent well, at your fairs, 15, 20, 22 retail. American. I don't know if... if um, but car- you know what? If you stay in that range, even above 24, 25 yeah. or whatever, what 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 do you think of? I mean, you can go regions. Like yeah, well, Chilean you know, wines are not making... Let's talk about make, this. I mean, I, I, I like, how know. much is this wine? I, I actually don't know how much that would retail. So do you think it's more than 25 bucks? I think pro- probably not. Probably in, in, right. in, in, in that uh, region. 23. Um, you know, and the, the Yumbel Pepeño, um, because, you know, when, when I buy wines from the, from the club, I obviously have a budget. So some wines are... Like for Christmas, there's a champagne, which means that some of well, the yeah, wines you're need gonna to be yeah, visit different yeah. price ranges. And the Yumbel Pipeño, I'm sure, would retail under under twenty bucks in 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 a so shop. So a, Ch- a Chilean Pipeño. Pipeño, you know, you have you have access to fruits that are, um, you know, hundred two hundred year old. You you know, natural wine, but but you know, it's still. They're still selling it for, for I think for me too cheaply, um, because I would like I would love to see these farmers you know pay pay the farmers more well, because that's that's the whole thing. But look at this one. So you know this is um, Gonzalez Bastias. They are so they were in LA. They're also pouring in New York, uh, which is why I thought this would be a good little wine to, to try. It's from Maule, uh, old vines. M A U L E Maule, a region of Chile, yes. which is in the south of Chile, which is right? home um, of. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of pais and and all the all the grapes that were planted by by the missionaries when they arrived in the 16th century. Can I ask you a question about Malay? Do you know, like in Argentina, they're making wine south in Patagonia. Is Malay south of the known wine regions in Chile? Is it a southern? It's, it's south, but you know, I think it's about 500k from Santiago. Okay. Uh, you know, Maule, Bio, Bio, Itata, all these all these regions are basically in the right. southern, right. What, you know, yeah, the southern part of, of Chile. I don't know how that would compare with, um, if you looked at Argentina in terms of latitude, we'd have to look at, uh, have it, to look uh, at the map. Patagonia may be a little further south, yeah. but this is south yeah, this of is south, Chile yeah, compared yeah, yeah, to yeah, yes. the traditional Compared vineyard. to like the central vineyards, you know, when you talk about the so Maipo and so on. So the, here, the maker is... What's so, Gonzalez Bastias. Okay. Um, so, Gonzalez, B-A-S-T-I-A-S, Bastias. Yeah. Uh, Bas, uh, Gonzalez, Z, and then Bastias. Right. Um, husband and wife team, really, you know, very low production. Uh, this is a blend of Pais, Moscatel, and... Um, is, what did we say? I can't remember. This year, 
a Torontel bias and, and, and Moscatel. Um, it's, you know, skin contact on, on the whites, of, obviously. Um, it's, and got then, a, it's got a pale orange. Yeah. It's, so you, I when I walked long, in, you said it's an orange. Well, yeah. no, you may have said skin it's contact, not like orange. It's an orange one. But yeah, it yeah, is yeah, an yeah, orange Yeah, it's on the skin. Right. Um, they use the saranda, so they use very traditional um, uh, destemming method on, on like the, the sort of bamboo. They, this saranda is like this, this bamboo. Uh, bamboo mesh, uh, very traditional that they're still they're still using. It's um, f- you know fermented in open lagas and and then aged in, in amphora. So it's like very 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 everything that they do is incredibly uh, traditional. Very small production. I think it's about five hectares. Um, so tiny production, but really representative of the energy and the artisanal care that is happening right now in 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 in, in Chile. And that's why I think it's, uh, for me, it's a region that's worth exploring. I've been there. Um, I'm going back there early next year um, to spend more time with, with the growers. And but it's will, beautiful. The they, heritage there is incredible, you know, really. It's, it's so underrated. Well, t- we talked about it. There are older vines, right? Um, there are some interesting varietals in Chile that, very different varietals to what we what we know. You right. know, in the south, I mean, Chile has this kind of dual um, dual wine heritage, where on the one hand you've got all the grapes that were planted by you know by by various vagues of uh, you know by by the, the missionaries in the 16th centuries, and then and then obviously um, you know people planted the the, the the pais mostly, which was completely I would say undiscovered and underrated, even though it's the most widely planted grape variety in, in Chile until probably about 15 years ago, where it's now experiencing a renaissance. It's ungrafted vines because it's unrooted. There's no phylloxera in, in, in Chile. It's ideal conditions because this Mediterranean climate is very dry. There's very little pressure disease, you know, disease in ter- uh, pressure in terms of disease. It's it's dry farm. Do, do ungrafted vines have a name? Is that head trained? No. No, they, these are bush vines. So the bush vines is the way it's trained. It's right. like head trained bush vines. Right, right, literally right. Literally very, very... To the ground, so, huge, huge vines. So it's got this this amazing heritage, and thankfully, you know, now the fact that there are more and more natural wine producers in Chile, they, you know, they they, they are being preserved because up till recently, these vines were being grubbed to either plant uh, pine right. for the paper industry because right. there's a lot of pressure to 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 produce more paper, and you know, so people were were grubbing these hundred year old vines in order to plant pine trees it's to crazy. make paper. Uh, you know, so that Amazon can ship more more parcels around Boxes. around the world and toilet paper and so on. But now, you know, but it's not enough. We, we, we I think this is like um, a part of the world that really needs our support. Drink more Chilean wine. All right, so let's let's do the Grape Nation evaluation. So the color is, you know, a, an unfiltered, you know, pale orange. You know, beautiful orange wine. Put it up to your nose and just give me some nose descriptors you get from this. Yeah, so it's it's fairly aromatic, you know. You get a lot of, um, I would say, jasmine, white paper, almost. You know, Interesting. I, I hate using the word orange because obviously it's an orange wine, but you know, you get citrus, and that's skin you contact. Do. You get a lot of that kind of citrus peel, zest. Um, it's very clean, you know. There's no, I would say, there's you know, there's no VA. There's no. It's like a very pure it, and it still is very, bright. Th- it is bright, and there's a good purity there. Now, because I think a lot of orange wines these days can be a bit. Uh, dull and and you know people say to me oh gosh I've ma- f- macerated for five months I'm like okay why <laughs> why <laughs> you know sometimes a shorter maceration is is maybe better so on the mouthfeel is this a typical mouthfeel you get from a wine this is kind of a medium mouthfeel it's not this unctuous big wine and it's not thin it's got a nice mouth filling feel right yeah it's it's um you know the tannic intensity is very light um it's very pretty so it's i would say this is like um you know this is a, a, a obviously a fuller bodied white white wine uh, that's perfect for the for aperitif now you know it's i know it's barely uh, it's very midday but now it's no officially midday isn't it so we are allowed this. Uh, we were <laughs> allowed lunchtime. anyway. The Grape Nation rules. So are, zesty, fresh. Um, so you know, on the palate, do the palate descriptors replicate the nose descriptors, or what else do you get on the? Yeah, palate? I think I think I get. Um, I think that the palate is not as aromatic as the nose. I think the nose was was maybe a bit more expressive yes. here. I get more like aniseed. 
uh, dry herbs uh, coming through, but still a lot of brightness and and almost you know I'd say you know you wouldn't be if you said like you know apricot or that kind of white stony fruit uh, being present, you know a little bit of tannins, but not very much. This is a very light style, what, um, but what, really delicious. Yeah. What foods do we pair something what like this? I, I, well, I don't. It's funny. I've tasted hundreds of wines on the show, and I asked the question what to pair, and we've not tasted a lot of orange wines. So I have to kind of think about what pairs with orange wines. Um, I mean, it's so versatile. Honestly, if you, um, you know, from from salads to, you know, lunchtime fare, aperitif, I think salads, vegetables. Salted, salted. Salted I think nuts. some cheeses and nuts. Yeah, hot are cheese. Char- charcuterie, you know, not hot, too heavy. Hot cheese would be nice. Um, yeah, I just don't think it's a bloody steak wine or a hamburger wine. But mm-hmm. I think chicken. Yeah, or just fish. put in your in your backpack. And but you're not allowed to drink out outside in in the US on a, in the parks or you, you can. Okay, you can. Okay, it's quite all right. And believe <laughs> me, if you couldn't, people do. So <laughs> nobody uh, pays attention. Uh, all right, so that I will post this wine. Uh, that is our weekly wine sip. I will post the wine. Um, and if you get your ass out to raw wine, you'll be able to taste this. Isabel, we have to wrap up. Let me do a quick wrap up and I need to get some info from you so everybody knows what to do and where to go. So if you have a question, suggestion, wine happening or event, hit me up at sam at the grapenation.com. That's sam at the grapenation.com. Subscribe to the Grape Nation podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your pods. Um, we ask you to subscribe because if you subscribe, the pod shows up. And if you listen to past Isabel shows, you'll wake up and there's Isabel in bed next to you. <laughs> so please subscribe. Um, leave a review if you like the podcast. Um, follow us on Instagram at SBenRuby and on Twitter at BenRuby. I know that can be confusing, but you can reach us via the hashtag, The Grape Nation, to find us on both. We're on Facebook at The Grape Nation. As I mentioned, we'll post Isabel's wine list. She gave us some very interesting recos there, as we expected. And we will post the uh, Chilean wine we tasted for our weekly wine sip um, on our social media sites. All right, so Isabel, everybody's like, wow, that was a great podcast, except for Sam. Where, where, <laughs> what do we do? Where do we go? When is this raw wine? So if people, let's start with raw wine. If people want to know more about raw wine, there's a website, right? Yeah. So it's rawwine.com. So it's R-A-W-W-I-N-E. Two W's. Don't yeah, two chintz w's. out on that one W, <laughs> <It's> right? <like, laughs> dot com. Um, and then you go on the website and you can find, so we have a section called People and Places and you can find thousands, references of thousands of growers and their wines. So you can Which explore. Which we talked about. Exactly. All, uh, and then bios. there's a section called Fair. And then you click on fairs and it will take you to all the different fairs that we have going on at the moment. So if you go on to New York, it'll give you the list of all the growers attending, all their wines. Um, and then if you... It'll also give you the speaker's corner, who's speaker's there corner, and what yeah, we're talking about. You can buy about. a ticket. Uh, come on the Monday if you work in the industry because Monday is, is industry day. So it's, uh, you know, it's more focused that way. But, you know... Also come, I mean, people uh, People come for the weekend, really. I right. mean, I've got so many people who just come in for both right. days. So, you know, uh, come come whenever you, you, you want, of course. We'd love to have you there. Uh, there's also a section called Raw Wine Week on the website and events going on like at 10 Bells and other places are posted on our website. So if you're coming in to town for the events. weekend, then you can go and, and hang out with growers on a more intimate level. But we'd love to see you. could to find see the online store, but that's only in the UK. That's only in the UK. But the wine club? Yeah, so the, on the, from the access, website, there's okay. a, a, a sh- the, the wine club area, and then you can go and explore. So really and everything you, so much you need. so also for you coming to, you know, with Heritage Radio Network, you know, you're actually part of Speaker's Corners. Yes. We love having you there. We are a pleasure to be part of it. The, the day I met you... The day you consented to do the show was the day I fell in love with you, and I am glad to say that we are still friends. We're still and married. Very, yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. So basically, raw wine. Now, what about social media? Instagram is very popular. Yeah, raw wine world. Raw wine world. Yeah, yeah, raw wine world. Yeah, we couldn't get uh, somebody already had raw wine. They don't do anything and with it. And you have a personal. You have Isabel Legero and Isabel, it. Yeah, but you know, go you to know, raw I, wine. World. Yeah, because I'm, I'm like, a, you know, Sam and I, you know, I, I told you. Um, 
I'm very, very private, and I'm not, I'm not, I, I, I'm not a very social media person, but I, I communicate everything via Roman. And well. by the way, just you know, as a, a, a point. If you go to the Raw Wine Fair, you will see Isabel there the whole time running around. She's doing one of the speaker's corners. You know, this is somebody who's accessible. So, I mean, oh, come she, and say hi. Yeah, I she's love in when the people. Thick of it. Yeah, yeah. All right, Isabel, we got to wrap up. So, I want to thank our guest, Isabel Legeron. I want to thank everyone at the Heritage Radio Network. I'm Sam Ben Ruby, and you've been listening to The Grape Nation. The Grape Nation is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.